I'm Claire Hughes Johnson. It is very exciting to be here um, to host Adele Waldman, who happens to be my sister-in-law. <laughs> my brother and my husband are also here. It's a family event today. Um, but we couldn't be more proud of Adele and pursuing her dream and realizing it, woo, um, it with this novel, but I, hopefully many more. Uh, I'll give a little bit of an intro so folks have a background on Adele, and then she's going to read a bit from The Love Affairs, and then we'll just do a little bit of Q&A and invite folks in the room uh, to ask questions. So Adele went to Brown University, grew up in Baltimore. She went to Brown University. Go Bruno, I happen to also go to Brown <laughs> University. Um, and she worked as a reporter in, for the New Haven Register and also the Cleveland Plain Dealer, uh, and then moved to New York and started writing and doing other things, yes? Is that accurate or not? Yeah, so that's pretty good. There huh? was SAT tutoring in there. SAT tutoring to make some bucks on the side there. As a, as a writer, you need to make some bucks in other ways often. Exactly. Um, and ha has written for a few publications like The Village Voice and, and some bigger ones coming up, I think. But other ones? Many publications, as many a freelance writer has experienced. But um, I've written book reviews for the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and the New Republic and working on something for the New Yorker now. But <laughs> this and that mixed with, um, well, this and that. <laughs> yeah, mixed with right. We'll have Adele tell us a little bit more about the writing process once she reads from the book. This book, uh, which we highly publicized in our notes, but has been named a book of the year last year by anybody you can name, The Economist, NPR, L, Vogue, <laughs> The Washington Post, I don't know, it was like a huge list. That is incredibly impressive. It is on the paperback version here, which is the first I've seen it. I ordered some from Amazon. Ooh. It says national bestseller, so that is pretty rock star. Um, and is, I think, viewed as a great success and has gotten a lot of attention in articles as well for various reasons, which maybe we'll get into. But one of them, of course, is it's written from the male perspective. And people find it interesting when they meet Adele, who is one of the nicest, greatest, um, non-male people that I know. <laughs> um, so we'll, we'll get into that. But why don't we do a quick reading, wow. and then I'll ask some questions. Sound good? All right, great. great. Well, thank you for that intro. That was the loveliest intro, and the most personal one. <laughs> I've never been introduced by a family member. It was nice. Um, so I'm going to say a few words before I start reading, if that's OK. So the book, as the title suggests, The Love Affairs of Nathaniel P. It's not kind of obvious that the book is going to be about this guy's love life. Um, Nathaniel P. is a writer in New York. He's in his early 30s, and he is achieving some professional success when the book begins. And when he was in his 20s, he was a struggling freelance writer. I can relate to that part. And, but he wasn't that popular with women. He's, he's like a fine-looking guy, but he's not the best-looking guy. But as he's hit 30 and he started to do better professionally, he's becoming more popular with women. And that is having mixed consequences. He, in the past few years, he sort of had a habit of pissing women off. And he's got a number of exes who aren't super pleased with him. And so he's not, he's not a terrible guy. He doesn't wake up in the morning and think, I'm going to hurt women today. But he has a number of ex girlfriends who aren't too pleased with him. So the section I'm reading, though, is, is not about Nathaniel, or as he's often called, Nate, in New York. It's backstory about the days before he got to be this guy, when he was in high school and college. And well, he was, he was different back then. And all you need to know, all that's happened, is that in the first chapter, Nate has run into an ex-girlfriend on the streets of Brooklyn, and the encounter did not go super well. It ended with her calling him an asshole and storming off. So this is chapter two. Nate had not always been the kind of guy women call an asshole. Only recently had he been popular enough to inspire such ill will. Growing up, he had been considered nice. He was also a wonderkind of advanced placement classes, a star debater, and a fledgling songwriter whose extra credit homage to Madonna for Math Appreciation Week, like a cosine solved for the very first time, had, unfortunately, been broadcast to the entire upper school. Despite playing on the varsity soccer and baseball team since 10th grade, granted his was a Jewish day school, Nate never quite achieved the reputation of an athlete. 
He didn't repel girls, exactly. They sought him out for help with bio or calculus, even for advice about their personal problems. They flirted with him when they wanted an ego boost, and then they told him about their crushes on Todd or Mike or Scott. Nate wasn't much to look at back then. Dark-haired and skinny, he had a pale, sunken chest that he felt made him look cowardly, as if he were perpetually shrinking back. Though he wasn't painfully short, he wasn't tall, either. His hands, eyebrows, nose, and Adam's apple appeared to have been intended for a much larger person. This caused him to hold out hope, even as high school progressed, that he might spring up another couple inches into the five-foot double digits. In the meantime, though, these attributes didn't add much to his existing stock of personal charms. Todd and Mike and Scott were Nate's soccer and baseball teammates. Scott was the most popular guy in their class. He was tall and broad-shouldered and had that combination of crudeness and confidence that rendered intelligence not only irrelevant, but slightly ridiculous, a peculiar, if not entirely unamusing talent, like the ability to ride a unicycle. Todd and Mike and Scott were not exactly Nate's friends, at least not on terms of equality, but they thought he was funny. They also relied on him for help with calculus. Todd and Mike did anyway. Scott never made it past trigonometry. Nate went to their parties, Nate got drunk. Jokes were made about how funny it was that Nate, barred to the math department with the 4.0 GPA, was drunk. Meanwhile, Nate pined for girls like Amy Perelman, the stacked blonde siren of their class, whose bashfully averted eyes and modest smile were nicely offset by her clingy sweaters and ass-hugging jeans. Naturally, Amy went out with Scott, although one day she confided to Nate that she was worried about their future. I mean, what will become of him? Like if his dad's stores, liquidated designer goods, don't keep doing well? My dad says they are, like, over-leveraged. But Scott can barely read. I mean, he can read, just not like whole books. But I can't see him doing well in college and getting a regular job. It just wouldn't be him, you know? In retrospect, it wasn't surprising that Amy Perelman, who was not actually stupid, but only affected stupidity in her speech, because that was the fashion, eventually ditched Scott and got an MBA from Wharton. At the time, however, Nate had, somewhat to his surprise, come to Scott's defense. He's a good guy, though, and he really likes you. Amy looked thoughtful, but not quite convinced. I guess. Meanwhile, Nate did have one admirer during high school, frizzy-haired Michelle Goldstein. It wasn't that Michelle wasn't pretty. He'd been interested in girls who looked worse, anyway. But there was something painfully self-conscious about her. While it should have been refreshing to see someone at their school engrossed in Mary Wollstonecraft's a vindication of the rights of women, Michelle's embrace of culture seemed a bit affected. She had an inexplicable fondness for the phrase pas de deux, which Nate had once, frighteningly enough, overheard her use in reference to her relationship with him. Still, at moments, he felt real affection for Michelle. One spring night, it must have been after a school play or concert, they sat together for hours on a bench outside the upper school, gazing down a grassy hill toward the dark expanse of the athletic fields. Michelle spoke intelligently, touchingly, about the music she liked, moody female singer-songwriters with socially progressive lyrics, and of her intention to live in New York one day, to go off into the Strand, a huge used bookstore downtown, she explained. Nate wasn't sure if he'd even been to a used bookstore. There weren't any in their suburb, he didn't think. You should go to New York sometime, Michelle said. I've been. We didn't go any place like that. From his family's weekend in New York, Nate had photos taken by his dad of him and his mother huddled together on the observation deck of the Empire State Building. They wore newly purchased ponchos and smiled wanly while a cold drizzle fell on their heads. Michelle smiled sympathetically. In the light that spilled over from the parking lot, Nate thought Michelle's freckles and straw-colored hair were cute. He nearly reached out across the bench and touched her, her hand or her thigh. It wasn't even about sex. Nate's life had been somewhat short on friendship, real friendship, distinct from the sort of conditional alliance he had with Scott and company. Sitting on the bench with Michelle, Nate felt as if the two of them shared something, some nebulous, slightly melancholic sensitivity that made them different from their classmates. But at school on Monday, Michelle seemed to have reverted back to her other self. I can't believe you got an A on that test, she said after calculus. What a coup d'etat. She gave a little wave as she walked away. Ciao, Cherie. Coup, and they wanted to shout. You mean just plain coup. Yet he and Michelle were constantly lumped together and treated as a couple. Scott repeatedly asked him if her cooter smelled like mothballs because of all the vintage clothes she wore. <laughs> Michelle's ambiguous social status, neither cool nor uncool, apparently made her his female equivalent. They even went to senior prom together. Nate had been working up the nerve to ask a pretty sophomore, and he felt both resentment and relief when Michelle's asking him foreclosed that possibility. On prom night, he thought Michelle might, have, might even have been willing to have sex, but he didn't really try, although they made out. Well, more than made out, actually. He had a brief opportunity to assess Scott's hypothesis vis-a-vis -vis the bouquet of her female parts. 
But Nate didn't push, because at that particular moment in his life, he didn't want to get entangled with a girl who was slightly repulsive to him. Nor could he imagine sleeping with Michelle and then blowing her off, the way that Todd or Mike might have. Although not Scott, he, for all his crudity, was sensitive and unwavering in his devotion to Amy. There was something that rubbed Nate wrong about Todd and Mike's attitude toward girls. Their implicit belief that whatever befell a foolish or unattractive one was her just desserts. Empathy they reserved for the best looking girls. Amy Perelman's most minor setbacks, a B plus or mild cold, elicited coups of grave concern. Besides, by prom, Nate had largely begun to pin his erotic hopes on college, where he imagined even girls who looked like Amy Perelman would be smart and, more important, mature, a word he had lately begun to interpret as willing to have sex with him. If he were to list the biggest disappointments of his life, freshman year of college would be near the top, right behind the realization, much later, that even something as seemingly sublime as a blowjob, his penis in a woman's mouth, could be boring, even slightly unpleasant, under the wrong circumstances, or performed inexpertly. And I think I'm going to leave off at that slightly embarrassing <laughs> note. I didn't quite realize what it would feel like to be reading that in such a brightly lit room <laughs> at 1 p.m. I do a lot of readings at night. At like night in bookstores. It doesn't feel like a cozy bookstore. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So um, let's talk a little bit and then definitely think of questions, folks who are here. First about the book and then maybe a little bit about getting to the book. Um, you are always asked this question, but I think it is one to it. Why did you choose to write from Nate's perspective? Um, right. I, I love this question. So Nate is he's a, he's a guy and I'm not. And that's I feel like the most, in some ways the most salient fact about, about the book. And I, I did that in part because I had this... I had this sense one day, I was reading a book by a male author that was, among other things, about his relationship, or about the male character's relationships. And I, I was lying at the park near my apartment reading, and I had this feeling, this was like a light bulb going off in my mind, that I felt like I knew more about this guy's emotional life than he did. And, and I felt that I, that I did because I'd spent my 20s dating various people, some of whom were better to date than others, and trying to analyze these bad boyfriends and talking to my friends about their boy bad boyfriends and to my male friends about their relationships. And I felt like sometimes the, the problem was that these guys were not actually taking the time to think about why they were doing what they were doing. So I had this thought, it's like, I think I could use all this insight I have, all, the, all these years I spent thinking about the, these guys and, and put it into a book. But that seemed kind of crazy. So it was this idea in the back of my mind that I just thought I would, that it was almost like a joke or a dare. And, um, but I kept coming back to it. And then I started to combine that with this idea that I felt that I'd read a lot of books, books that I love by, by male authors like Philip Roth and Saul Bellow and more modern male authors as well, but about a young man who is smart and ambitious and comes to the city to, to sort of conquer it with his intellect and, and cuts a wide swath through the female population. And usually he's really, he's charming as a protagonist, but, and as readers, we identify with him and sympathize with him, but I think that oftentimes the way these guys treat women isn't really scrutinized. And I thought, wouldn't it be neat to write a book that has, follows that same archetype, but but really pays attention to how this fan treats women. And so I decided to give it a try. I thought I would just try a chapter or two to see how it went. And then four years later, there was a book. <laughs> That's great. And so Nate is not the most appealing protagonist. And I also think it's funny because a lot of the male reviewers, particularly those who live in New York or who are in this sort of mm -hmm writing scene, if you will, kind of said, oh, I recognize myself. <laughs> right. And I thought, how, how are they dealing with that fact that they're recognizing themselves in, because he is very real, but he's also hard to deal with. If any of you have read the book, um, it's a fascinating exercise because it's so well written and you're interested in what's happening, but you also want to punch him, I, at least for me. Right. I'll speak for myself. I, Occasionally, I wanted to punch him. And you're not the only one, Claire. It's not <laughs> some especially violent tendency on your part. I, <laughs> I've heard that from many, many women. Um, and, and definitely from certain men, too. So there is an interesting gender divide, I think, in response to the book, because I think men 
tend to say that they, they relate a little bit to Nate, but they're not proud of it. They don't read this book and they're not like, oh, yes, that's me. They see some of their, um, some habits that they're not so proud of. And I think by, by virtue of, of the guy saying that he, he, see, he kind of winces with rec recognition in reading the book, I think that by virtue makes these guys better than Nate because they're more self-aware. Um, but what women also sometimes, I think, respond in, in a way that is maybe wincing or cringing, but it's not because they recognize themselves in Nate, but they recognize men they've dated in Nate. And so there's that divide. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I tried in writing the book not to think very much about whether I liked Nate or not. I just really wanted him to feel real. And I wanted him to be as slippery as any ex-boyfriend that I or my friends had ever had and to not be completely bad or completely good. And I have to say this, whether I, there are aspects of Nate that I like. I have this moral critique of him, but I don't, I don't hate him across the board. Um, and I wanted to be fair to him. I didn't want to make him just a, a standard villain. I, I wanted to make him someone that men wouldn't read the book and think, oh, this sounds like a bitter ex-girlfriend's revenge fantasy. I, and that would undercut the purpose. And so I think Nate, or I hope he's complicated. He's definitely complicated, though. It struck me as a very intelligent, bitter ex girlfriend <laughs> <laughs> fantasy, possibly. And that, but uh, frankly, Hannah, the female protagonist, though obviously not as central as Nate in the book, but very important, is not, a, is not faultless, right? right? I mean, I think that's the other thing is you're kind of, if you're a woman, for me, reading the book, I'm kind of wanting to s have my older self say, knock some sense into her as well. Absolutely. And did you... Yeah, so in the book, there's one main relationship that takes up the arc of the plot, and it's Nate starts dating this woman named Hannah, and the relationship starts off with a fair amount of promise. Hannah's a little bit skeptical of him at first. He's, he's kind of got a rep as a womanizer these days, so she, she's skeptical, but he seems very into it and wins her trust, and she lets her guard down, and things are good for a little while. And then Nate just starts losing interest. It starts really subtly. He, and he doesn't even know why it's happening at first. And so we can't explain why. And Hannah starts to sense that. And that makes her feel insecure. And as she feels a little bit insecure, he becomes a little irritated by her insecurity. It's this cycle. And it was really important to me to write about that cycle because I felt like it was something familiar, and I don't think it's only men who behave like Nate. I think we've all been a Nate, and we've all been a Hannah, regardless of our gender. And but I I felt like it can be hurtful if you're in Hannah's position, if you've come to to care about someone, and then you sense them pulling away, and you don't know why. And I've definitely heard from a lot of of readers who are, and women readers who are disappointed in Hannah because she does. She gets more insecure, and she becomes weaker and needier. And, and I think as a woman, you read the book, and you just want to tell, you, you want her to kick him to the curb. And, and I wish she would. I, too, feel the same way that, that Claire did. But it was important to me that she not do that, because I felt that, ironically, it would be letting Nate off the hook if Hannah got away too unhurt. That I felt like to show how hurtful his behavior is, I had to show its effect on Hannah. It gets under her skin. She, He's not so bad that he, she, that she can just break up with him instantly. She's trying to, she likes him. She's trying to make the best of it. And he does things like, she, like she asks him if something is wrong because she senses something is wrong, and he says no, but in a tone of voice that clearly suggests there is. And, and I think that can be maddening. And it's it's hard to know. It's like, do you break up with a person because they're being a little cool or distant? But maybe they've just had a bad day, or maybe they're stressed. So I felt like it was really important to, to kind of allow Hannah to, to really run the gamut and, and be, be hurt. And she ultimately does, oh, I shouldn't give away too much, but um, I understand that frustration. I, too, wish I could shake Hannah and get her to break up with Nate and, and Nate could sort of earlier get the comeuppance he definitely deserves. But I didn't, I didn't think that would serve my purpose in being realistic and also in showing just just how harmful Nate's that kind of behavior can be for the other person. So last 
Well, I will say, if you haven't read the book, there are these like moments in Nate's inner monologue. First of all, he assesses every woman physically I immediately, which you have to believe is happening. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but also things like the pillows on her bed bug the crap out of him, and like how she's decorated. You know, these these moments are just very specific and exactly right. Um, there's also been a question that I get, which is, is, is there any of your brother in Nate? And the answer I give is, I think his hideous apartment um, <laughs> is, is potentially drawn from my brother's excellent housekeeping skills. But I won't put you on the spot too much on right. that. But you've probably had to deal with, how did you create mm -hmm. Nate? And well, definitely. Is, the, is there a specific individual? Or? There is no particular individual, and certainly not my... Um, my kind husband, Claire's brother. He <laughs> like, I don't want to um, make trouble here. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps some very minor details, such as the top of Nate's dresser. I did maybe peer at the top of my husband's dresser to see what kind of junk he kept on it. But that's about it. It's, um, and the hideous apartment. <laughs> <laughs> but in a deeper way, so Nate, the way he sizes up women, writing that was so weird and painful. And I had a a good friend of mine who I would give the novel to in chunks when I was writing it, and I gave her the first five chapters to read, and then we met for a drink to discuss it. And she was like, I have, I have to tell you, I'm feeling a little uncomfortable. When, when I, now that I've read the book, I feel like when, when we see each other, are you checking out my breasts? <laughs> I was like, no. And when I am writing and being Nate, it's a totally different world. When I'm back to being Adele, like it, the world looks normal again. Um, and but I, I get that, and some of what I wrote in the book really disturbed me. It, it, I felt to do what I wanted to do well enough, I had to put my own feelings aside because a lot of what Nate thinks are actually the things that I most feared an ex-boyfriend would have thought about me when we were dating. They, were, they weren't comforting for me to imagine, but I felt that there was a reason to do that, in part because I didn't, I didn't want it to read like any kind of fantasy. I wanted it to be a serious book about dating, and I don't think that's an oxymoron. I think many of us who spend a good portion of our adult lives single in this day and age, and that the, the struggles of finding the right person and, and dating are, deserve to be taken seriously. They're not inherently just frothy and the stuff of romantic comedy. So I wanted to write what felt a serious, if not always comforting, book about these subjects. And and I got freaked out. And the one story I love to tell about Evan, Claire's brother, my husband, is there were times when I'd just write something I felt, felt was so disturbing, just like Nate, one of Nate's fantasies, or just he'd be sizing up women's bodies. And I would just be in my little office, and I'd get all disgusted. And I'd come out, and I'd see Evan, and I would just be mad at him for <laughs> being a guy. And then Evan would feel like it was unfair that I was <laughs> mad at him for what I made my imaginary characters <laughs> say and do in my imaginary world. And I think he had a point. But I had a point, too, I think. <laughs> but yeah, wow, men. But actually, I have to say to the men in the room, I, they're n I don't think all men are as bad as Nate. Um, I do think Nate behaves in some stereotypically male ways. And that was important to me. I didn't want to write a male character that maybe was believable as a male, but but sort of on the far end of being feminine. And I wanted to write like a kind of uber masculine guy who does the things like he doesn't, he's ambivalent about wanting a relationship. He goes out on a couple of really good dates and then takes like a week to call. He, he when asked if something is wrong, he's apt to say no just because he wants to avoid a conversation. I thought just behaviors that I felt seemed kind of not typical of every man. And again, women have, we have our own, I, women do these things as well. But it was very interesting to try to explore in a fair way the thinking that might underlie these behaviors. So I don't want to give it away, but I love the ending of the novel. I found it fascinating when I learned that some of the readers, including more professional readers, thought the ending was a happy ending. Uh, I'm not saying it's an unhappy ending. I think it's an ending that really makes you think. But how, do you ha how did you handle it when various reviewers or readers or even editors sort of made comments about the novel that were not maybe your intended? Or is that, was right. that exciting to see a different interpretation? A little bit of both. So 
one of the challenges for me in writing this novel was that it's all told from Nate's perspective. It's, in, it's written in something called the close third person, so it's not first person, I'm not writing like I this, I that, which would be a little bit weird for me as a woman to be writing first person from Nate's perspective. But, but so it's close third, there, it's always in his head. You don't get the perspectives, you don't get the inner thoughts of any other character and there's no narrator making judgments. And that was really hard for me because I'm actually a pretty moralistic, judgmental person in a lot of ways. And I wanted to step in and be like, okay, I, we know that when Nate does this, it's bad for these reasons and he's being a jerk here. But I couldn't because it's in his head. So I also felt like that left open room for interpretation. And there's a lot of things that I think about what are around with Nate that they're just, they're not in the book. And, and it's been very interesting for me to hear different people's responses. And I have a mixed reaction. In some ways it's exciting when people read the book really differently because it makes me feel that I have been fair, that, that the ending was, was fair if some people can read it as a happier ending and some as a sadder ending. It sort of depends how you feel about the person and the relationship Nate is in. And I, I wanted it to be as realistic as any relationship that any, anyone we know might be in. It's not 100% it's not perfect, but I don't think any of us are in relationships that are. And just, you know, just like relationships with your friends or that a friend might have, you, you might think, oh, she could have done a little bit better. But then someone else might be like, no, 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 they're pretty happy. So I, I wanted it to feel like that. So in the one sense, it's gratifying if there's a variety of responses. Like, like I wasn't too heavy handed and didn't force my perspective. On the other hand, at moments, it's frustrating. I'm like, what? I totally wanted everyone to think this other thing. That's very honest. So t let's talk um, a minute about you got a novel published. That's a big deal. So t uh, can you talk a little bit about your journey to that sure. and sort of career choices you made? Yeah. We always like to have talks about career development at Google. And so <laughs> this is a very non-Google-y career <laughs> that Adele has developed. Right. And I think it's pretty fascinating. Right. Well, I graduated from college with the desire to write a novel. The problem was I had zero ability to actually write a novel at that point. I somehow thought that it wouldn't be as hard as it was. And, um, but soon after I graduated from college, I, I realized, I, I don't know why I had thought I could just do this and it would just work. So I went into journalism as a good day job, as something that seemed kind of fun. I knew people who worked as, as journalists. I thought it could only help my writing and I'd learn more about the world. And it turned out to be great. And I spent my 20s working in, I first started at a financial trade publication, and then moved from there to the New Haven Register, a newspaper in Connecticut. And, and it was great. It was a lot of fun. But in the back of my mind, I always wanted to be a novelist, which, which wasn't great. You know, when you do those job interviews, and they're like, where do you see yourself in five years? I'd be like, novel? No, I would like to be covering international affairs for the <laughs> New York Times. <laughs> um, so. It was always on my mind, and then when I was about 29, maybe it was freaking me out, like, oh my god, am I going to spend my whole life as a person who in the back of my mind wants to write novels, but, but never does, I decided to take a bold step. I was writing a column for the WallStreetJournal.com called Act One about 20-somethings personal finances, and I quit that gig, and I wrote my last column about how I was going to sublet my apartment and move in with my parents and spend six months writing a novel. And I did. And the amazing thing is I actually wrote a novel. And it had, I had never written anything that had more than like 30 pages before I gave up because it was horrible. I mean, and it really was, what I'd written was horrible. So this, the fact that it actually finished one in six months blew me away. And it was a little bit unrealistic about what would happen next. I, I came back to New York at the end of six months. My subletters moved out. I thought, I thought it would just be a matter of months before I got an agent, the no that novel was sold, I was on, being interviewed by Terry Gross on Fresh Air, I never had to or work your again. <laughs> <laughs> right. Granted, <laughs> no. I did not exist then, I realize, in your life. <laughs> right. I mean, I, yeah, I just thought, this is great, I'm done. So it didn't actually proceed that smoothly. And I moved back to New York, and I decided, since I was only going to be like, non-famous for six weeks or something, that I should... Um, I'd just get a job tutoring as an SAT tutor because it just seemed like, why bother to try to find another journalism job for such a short time? I wound up being an SAT tutor for six years. It didn't go as planned. So that novel didn't find a publisher. 
And it took me a while to realize that's actually for the best. At the time, I was devastated, for, definitely devastated. But over time, I saw that, that I had learned a lot from writing that novel, but it really, it wasn't ready to be published. And eventually, I met, I met Evan, my husband, and I have to, I like to give him credit for this, that he, he sort of pushed me to start another novel. He said, well, you know, you can't just always dwell on the novel that didn't get published. If you want to be a novelist, now you know you can write a novel, and why not start another? And that led to my starting this one. And it took a lot longer than six months, which I hope is good for the quality of the novel. <laughs> I wound up taking about four years to, to write it. And in that time, I found a, a literary agent who was a person who then takes it to publishers and sells it. And, and she sold it very nicely and quickly, which was gratifying after my last experience. So the, uh, but, but all told, it was four years of writing, and then there's about another year before it actually appeared, because publishing takes a long time. So it was about five years from when I started writing to when it actually was a book, in which time I think that many people in my life, understandably, were sick of hearing me talk about this novel that never seemed to go anywhere. It's just a Microsoft Word document. So, um, and then you kind of achieved that dream you had with your first novel, which is this recognition and it is unusual for a first novel to get the attention and acclaim that The Love Affairs has received. That's true. Although did, did that strike you as gratifying, or do you know that that was unusual? <laughs> well, now, I know you know that intellectually. Right. But. Now I absolutely do, but at the time, I mean, at the, during the first novel, I mean, the thing is, I don't think I have ever achieved the glory I thought I would with the first novel, because I was so unrealistic. Oh, because I, there's Terry Gross involved, right? Okay. Right, and I just <laughs> thought this, never having to work again thing. You know, I just, I didn't really quite understand the economics of, of it. <laughs> um, so, so maybe I'll always be striving for that dreamed of glory. But no, no, it's, it's, been, it's been great. It's, and I think it's been good that over the years I learned more about the publishing industry and my expectations have been moderated. And then certainly the response to this novel has exceeded my expectations in, in, in so many ways that have been extremely gratifying, but, but I also think it was healthier to, to think smaller and to realize, too, that the main part of writing a novel is actually the writing of it, the time it's just you sitting there at the computer. And that part is actually really fun and gratifying, and I think that has to be the main thing because you never know what will happen with the response. Or sales, very mysterious. That's mysterious sales. So, um, and you're now on, so you did sort of a little bit of a tour when it was in, out in a hardcover, and now the way it works is they send you on another tour, yes, for right. paperback? Right. The whole publishing thing is actually fascinating if you don't work in that industry. <laughs> um, Interesting. Yeah, so I was in Portland on Monday night and Seattle last night, and then a place called Corte Madera, Corte Madera. Tonight. Yeah, tonight, and Oakland tomorrow. So it's exciting and, and fun. Um, do you go to these bookstores and you read and do you sign them and you mm -hmm. kind of? All right, chat I'm going to give the really do weird people show up. What kind of people show up? All right, I'm going to give the really candid answer. Yeah, you don't mind. this so is getting recorded. Monday night, I did the I did the um, reading in Portland at Powell's bookstore, a famous bookstore. Very iconic. It was great. It was so much fun. There, a good crowd came. The questions were great. It was really good. I. And I've done a lot of readings at this was point. Was it like young hipsters, basically, or what was it? Actually, an interesting mix. I remember two people in line that you do do a signing after. So I talked to people who buy the books and want me to sign them and chat for a minute. There were two women who said they were buying the books to help them understand their sons and that they thought that they might give the book to their sons. <laughs> and I think they had read about it in the in, in Alt Weekly in Portland, which is just, just run an interview. So there were, and there were some sort of older people, um, a, a mix, and then and then younger the younger hipster crowd, definitely, and and there's always an interesting gender mix. I have to say, at readings, and one thing that has also been been gratifying to me is that when you write a book about relationships, there's a perception that 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 it's for women, that only women care about it. And I have to say, my book has I think actually men might like it better, maybe because because <laughs> Nate is hard to like as a woman. Um, I get 
a lot of the reviews have been written by men, and I get about two thirds of the letters I get are actually from guys saying they relate to Nate and they, they see their thoughts reflected on the page. But, but again, while, while I also think that does make them better than Nate because they're self aware, but I also feel like it's just gratifying in this way to think men do care about relationships. This is a book, there is no B plot, it's all about relationships. There's no terrorism, there are no police chases, there's, there are no cigars or whiskey. Well, there's a little whiskey, but you know, I don't know. Um, so that, that's been neat. Hmm. So you were telling me, oh, hmm. Portland was great, so maybe not yes. everywhere is great. Oh my god. So then I went to Seattle last night. And Seattle has a great bookstore, Elliott Bay Bookstore. And wow, I, it was just a very, very different crowd. And nobody laughed. And the questions felt kind of hostile. Mm -hmm. It was just so different. And I, I don't know if it's just who comes. Maybe it was a, a beautiful day in Seattle, and the reading was in a downstairs basement. Maybe people were in a bad mood from being there. Maybe I read horribly. I don't know, but it can vary. So. What is a hostile question to an author? I mean, I don't. I guess it. It will it'll just be like, why, why are your characters so pretentious? Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> it's pretty. I did pretty almost overt. ask you a variant of that actually, <laughs> because there is some intellectual snobbery, right, in Nate and his circle of friends, and it's fascinating to watch him be so, you know, obsessed with women's breasts, and then in the next moment be, you know thinking about how to write about the in income inequality right. in, in radical new ways. And I thought that, I wondered if that people found that off-putting. Right. Because that group is, that's not most people's circle of friends. Right, right, right. Yeah, I really think that's been a factor with this book. And I don't know what to say about it. I, when I set out to write the book, I, I felt like I wanted to write the book the book that I was most interested in writing, and I didn't think it would be good as a writer to start thinking about what would appeal to the most amount of people and how could I create the most relatable character. I thought if I could make the character be very particular, I would hope that it would speak to people. And I guess I was also interested, as a writer living in New York in a particular subculture, there was a sort of intellectual sexism among men that, that interested me, and you know, I, was, I was around guys who I felt presume themselves to be sort of intellectual inheritors of greatness in this way that I felt that the women in, in our circle who, who are equally motivated and intelligent and well-read, I, I just don't know if we see ourselves in quite the same terms. And I, I really wanted to explore that without completely demonizing Nate, but trying to flesh out some of his more sexist thoughts. But he's, he's not a monster. He doesn't necessarily state these things aloud. He doesn't think women should be barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen, but he has some intellectual sexism. So that was important to me to explore, but there is a flip side, is that it's, it's just a, a book set among a self-consciously intellectual crowd, and, and I understand why that puts people off. I mean, it puts off people including my own parents, I think, a little. They think, they think and what about your friends? Oh, well, I think, well, huh, how do I answer this without seeming to undercut my friends? Are we all pretentious? That we <laughs> I'm not um, calling your friends pretentious, no, no. but I wonder if they think, oh, that's me and that's her. Right. And that's um, I think I've been very, very lucky, and I was also careful in writing the book, to try to make sure that the book was true to a general subculture, but not your specific. implicate individuals. Because that seemed, it's just not the kind, the book, has kind of, Nate's tone is not always very nice, and the thing, I mean, it's often not very nice, that the way he thinks about people, that I would never want any particular person to read the book and think Nate was thinking that way about them. So I, I feel like the, all the characters are very carefully designed to not be real people. But, but one thing, I have to say, it's I, a good friend of mine from high school who's not in this subculture at all, he read an early copy of the book, and he, he said he liked it, but he told me after the book was published that he was very, very relieved at the way it was received because he said that when he read it, he thought people in my world, writers in Brooklyn, would be kind of horrified because it portrays them so negatively and that I'd be kind of cast out and you know, just worried for my sake that what would I do? Actually, it hasn't been like that at all. And, and that has been, luckily I didn't, if I had expected what Matt expected for me, I would have been so much more nervous, but but I think that even people in this literary Brooklyn world sort of get a kick out of seeing 
through recognizable types. And, or in any case, it's, people have been very nice to me about the book in, in Brooklyn. That's great. Any questions? All right, we got a lot of questions. All right, we'll start over here. Yes. Right. I'm going to just restate the question quickly. So the comment was, without giving a lot away, the book has sort of a long relationship and a shorter relationship. And the longer relationship is a richer one and also gets more time in the book. And was that intentional in terms of time as well as how you perceived the relationship? Is that fair restatement? Right. Okay, I think this is a great question. It's only tricky for me to answer it in a way that is meaningful to those who have read the book without giving too much away. I'm going to try to do my best. So when I conceived the book, I knew from the very beginning who Nate was going to end up with. And, and I wanted it to be not obvious to, to readers any more than it was obvious to Nate. Um, and there, there was a basic little plot I had in mind that I felt that if I could take, I, I thought there's this thing that happens sometimes where this is from a woman's perspective, a woman in a heterosexual relationship. She's dating a guy, things are good for a while, then things are less good. He seems to be pulling away. She doesn't know why. Things get worse and worse, and then they finally break up. She is unhappy because she liked him, but she tells herself that well, this guy really has commitment issues, so that's clearly the problem. But then what happens? Like a month later, he's suddenly moving in with someone else who seems maybe less, less good for him on paper. And I thought, I, I felt like this was a scenario that seemed just common. I, I had heard of it from friends. So I thought, wouldn't it be neat to dramatize it, to dramatize all, all the players in it, and to be fair to each of them? And so that played a role in how I conceived the book. So in some ways, because those things happen quickly. Those right, like the final relationship happens quickly. It's like it takes a long time for maybe a bad relationship to play out, and um, a new a new relationship, in this case, seemed to happen more quickly. So so that's part of how I saw the book structure. I also thought after spending so much time on one relationship that I really wanted to trace this whole arc, it would be tiresome to do it again. Um, I think those are the, I think that might be the best I can do without giving too much away. But I think it's a good question because it's, it's an odd choice. I, 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 and it's, people, I do think the final chapter does seem to come rather quickly. You got a question? So the question was the process, was there an outline or a structure in mind? Was it iterative? What did you start right, with? Right. Well, I had this, this basic arc that I just described of, of the relationship from beginning to end that I wanted to show. So I went with that. And I didn't know from the very beginning who Nate was going to end up with. And so I put that character, well, I sort of put her in early in the book in a way that I, that there's this saying among writers of, um, that is from Chekhov, that Chekhov said, if there's a gun in the first act, it has to go off in the third act. So we really wanted the one Nate winds up with to be there from the beginning, but not necessarily in a way you pay attention to at the time. So in that sense, I was very much aware of, of the structure from the beginning. But that said, that makes me sound like I had so much more control or knew what I was doing. It took me so many years to write this book, in part because I had to go back and play with the structure to try to get a relationship in a slow decline the way Nate and Hannah's eventually is it was so hard for me. I feel like it's something we've all experienced, again, men or women in real life. But it's hard to dramatize a relationship just getting slightly worse because you know nothing happens. There's no 
no one cheats, no one, there's no violent fights where dishes are thrown. It's, it's sort of a series of dinners that are a little bit, something is off and they're kind of boring. It's like, how do I write about this without making the reader feel as bored as Nate and Hannah do in the moment? And, and to sort of get that right and try to come up with scenes that convey what's going on w and, and without being terribly boring was really tricky. So it's like I had this overall structure, but the micro scenes took me a long time. Great. Any other questions? Thank you. Oh, thank you. So the first was a lovely compliment that this book is recommended by our, <laughs> our questioner to his male friend. And the other is, um, so if you're not aware, uh, Adele recently wrote, uh, is a novella the right word? A little bit short story. I don't know. It's a, 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 short it's a story, long short story a long or short, short novella. A story um, called New Year from the perspective of one of the female characters of the book, one of the friends of, of Nate, who's a woman, who is a fascinating character, actually, in the book. Um, and why, why did that happen, or how did that come about kind of question? Yeah, so it's so interesting. It was, I didn't intend to write this this other short story, New Year's, exactly. I had mentioned casually to my publisher that, that I had a lot more material on each of the characters in, in my book than, than actually make it into the book, which is normal. I think as a writer, you spend so many years thinking about these characters. So I knew you know, it was fun for me to flesh out the backstory of all the characters, even though it's not actually in the book. And the publisher, the, the guy whose title is literally the publisher, um, said, you know, that might be fascinating. Would you be interested in taking some of this material and putting it into a story? And I said, no, absolutely not. <laughs> because I thought the book was an aesthetic whole. It was very important to me to keep it in Nate's perspective. I, I worried that another, another perspective, there would be a temptation for me to um, moralize too much. I worried about all sorts of things. At the same time, as soon as he had raise this possibility, some part of my mind was a little excited and intrigued by it because I really loved writing this book and I loved thinking about all the characters. So it was a little bit like an invitation to go back to a world that I'd had a lot of fun in. And in the end, I was persuaded to just give it a try. And I said, okay, okay I'll try it, but I'm not going to guarantee that we're going to publish anything because I, I did have concerns. And I wound up writing from the perspective of a character named Arit, who is sort of a truth-telling female friend of Nate. She gives him a hard time about the way he behaves with, with women. And she was a very fun character to write. And um, it, w it was seemed fun to inhabit her mindset. And it, and it was fun. And I have to say, when I sat down to write this story, it took on a life of its own. It wasn't something I had thought I would do or intended to do. But once I started doing it, I became invested in it. But I still feel a little it's hard for me to explain it because it wasn't something I ever thought I would do, and yet I really enjoyed it and I came to care about the story. Great. Any final last question? We're almost out of time. Do you have a question? Have a question. All right, great. How did you meet your literary agent? Oh, oh great. A practical question. Um, How did you meet the agent? Mm. So, well, when I had written that first novel that didn't get published, I didn't know anything about book publishing. It's funny, you'd have thought that I lived in New York and I worked in newspapers that I would know a lot, but there's actually a pretty strict divide between people in, in the newspaper world and in the publishing world. So, and that's probably too why I had these delusions of grandeur about what was going to happen. But I um, just, at that point, I wrote letters to, to literary agents that I saw in um, directories of, of literary agents. You can buy them. Now they're mostly online. And you can also read the acknowledgment pages of, of books to see who the author's literary agent is. I basically wrote, I actually wrote letters when I think about it. Some were paper letters. There were some that were email, but so long ago. Um, and, and that worked. I got some responses. People asked to see it. But then many of them said no to that particular book. But by the time I wrote this novel, 
I, one of my goals while writing it was also to learn more about the publishing world, to be in a better position by the time I finished the novel. So I had tried to make an effort to, to write book reviews and get to know people who were more mm -hmm. connected to the literary world and publishing and to meet more authors of books. And that helped a lot because this time when I wrote to agents, I, I, did, I did do the same thing. I, I was sort of kind of asked around to find out who some good agents were and I wrote emails, but this time I tended to write emails that said, my friend so-and-so, who's one of your clients, suggested I contact you. And that, that, I have to admit, helped a lot. On the other hand, I did get responses even the first time. I mean, I do think I, my first novel was rejected because of the contents, not because I didn't know people. But I do think if anyone here is thinking about these things, I, I think that it's, it is probably true that it's, it can be helpful to just to get a quicker response if you have some connection. And that's, that's unfortunate. I mean, one shouldn't have to live in New York and hang out with writers to, to get a quick response from a literary agent, but so it is. It's true in many businesses, <laughs> yes. I would see some nods in the room. Well, thank you so much, Adele, and thanks to all of you for coming and anyone who joined us on the live stream. Um, if you have not read the book, I hope you want to after this talk, and uh, have a great day. Thanks again. Thanks so much for being here.